Thank you for joining me for another Dear Sam Horse Help Horsemanship series. This week, the topic is spooky horses. So I get a ton of emails and phone calls and inquiries about horse training and clinics that all are based on people who have experienced um, highly spooky horses, highly reactive horses, um, hypersensitive horses, horses that seem to go from zero to 60, I call them light switch horses. Uh, and the behavior often scares the human, uh, often overwhelms the human, and can create a ongoing cycle of defensiveness in both the human and the horse um, as the person winds up becoming more and more passive, hoping to not bother or upset the seemingly overreactive or spooky horse. And then they start trying to sneak through scenarios and the horse is asking for support and guidance and the human is just waiting to see what the horse is going to do next. And it leads to a lot of unwanted uh, behaviors that I often talk about are the symptom and not the issue or the root cause. So I know big dramatic behavior in thousand pound prey animals can be quite overwhelming and I completely empathize with that. But one of the biggest missing pieces that I find, no matter whose articles I read or what videos are promoted that people try and share with me and ask what I think of them and how things are approached is everybody wants to address the spooky horse after the fact, meaning the spook is already happening and then we want to step in and interject or expect that our horse will have the mental capacity to hear us when they're emotionally already at, you know, a high defensive state and they cannot function and they're just trying to flee the scene or protect themselves or whatever it is that they've come up with in their probably dangerous and unwanted behavior. And so people fixate on, I don't want the spook to be big and dramatic. You know, I don't want my horse to react in these scenarios. And so then you hear words like desensitizing and, you know, you see scenarios where people are practicing repetitiously through patterns. We've talked about that recently in one of the past videos um, and how it really doesn't fix the spooking horse. And it may seem for a while to help uh, if you practice the same scenario multiple times, but then the day that the scenario changes, it feels like you have a fire breathing dragon. And one of the, one of the examples I often use for people is, let's say there was a tarp hanging on the railway in the aisleway that you had to walk past with your horse. And let's say your horse was very concerned and you're looking at the big movement or the defensive movement in the horse when he's concerned with the tarp. And so you practice however it is coaxing him through this stressful location, uh, spatial squeeze with the tarp hanging up that he has to walk past. And you do this back and forth, back and forth multiple times. And at some point, it feels like you're having success. Your horse is relaxing some. He seems to be letting down, or at least he doesn't seem to be scaring you so much. And then you come out to the barn one day and the tarp is moved somewhere else in a new location. You go to walk your horse past thinking, hey, we've worked on the tarp. Look how far he came. He's been so good about it when we walked past it recently. And then all of a sudden, it feels like you're starting over in getting your horse comfortable or okay with walking past the tarp in its new location. And this example happens all the time, doesn't have to be about a tarp. Um, but what happens is the human is under the illusion that because they've practiced spatially, you know, walking past the tarp, that somehow now the horse can tolerate the tarp wherever the tarp may show up. And the problem is this is just a symptom. We've never actually mentally engaged the horse's brain in order to change how he feels about the tarp. If we change how he feels about the tarp, it doesn't matter spatially, location-wise, where that tarp shows up. He doesn't have to become defensive for a new location. He might stop and notice it, but there will be a reasonableness. But if all we have done through patterns or repetition is practice having our horse learn to tolerate the thing that once scared him in one specific location, then he has a certain expectation of where that tarp will be. And the day that we change the location, it will feel like you're starting all over again because you have changed where it is that the horse had learned to tolerate or perhaps sort of accept uh, the tarp. And so now you feel like you're pulling your hair out because you have to start all over again. 
And this is what I often find with spooky horses. When people want to practice all this stuff or all this stimulus to try and get the horse to learn to be reasonable in their behavior, um, which is not an unwanted thing to want a reasonable horse where he can learn to think through a scenario and physically be reasonable in his response to new, unfamiliar, or even familiar situations. But the problem is people are waiting to interject until the most fearful defensive moment that the horse is experiencing. And then they sort of expect that the horse will suddenly have an availability to address what the human is asking or how that human is trying to delegate that they should handle the situation. And it's too late. The horse can't hear you. So one of the biggest things in addressing spooky horses is ignore the spooky moment. It's not about the spooky moment. It's about all of the moments that led up to the spooky moment. The spooky moment, the moment of eruption in dramatic unwanted behavior is usually a result and we call it the proverbial emotional cup, meaning if each thing that you start to ask your horse to do, however much it may seem to you something that may be a normal part of your interaction, um, if it is causing concern or fear to your horse, his emotional cup is filling. And so if each interaction or each segment of the interaction, you are thinking, well, we're doing okay because the horse isn't physically scaring you, but you're not recognizing the concern or a containment physically, a tightness and emotional defensiveness towards what you're doing with your horse, and you keep adding more and more and more, his proverbial cup is filling. And at some point, that cup will overflow. And the moment that the horse is spooking is usually the moment that the cup is overflowing. So it's not that everything you present for your horse that he's going to magically suddenly be okay with it from the very start. But the big missing piece is the human slowing down and acknowledging when the horse is communicating that he is having a problem. If we ignore the, hum the horse's communication and the signs in which he's showing that he's getting physically tight, that his breathing is changing, that he's mentally distracted, that he's getting strong in his responses and it feels like he's taking over or that there's a flea or a rush or a hurry in his movement to a certain situation and we ignore that because we can still sort of contain him, whether we're on the ground or sitting in the saddle, we are not addressing when the horse is asking for support and specific guidance. And so if we don't address it when it's still reasonable, the only thing that happens is the horse becomes more defensive, more physically tight and resistant. And then all of a sudden the horse spooks. Well, it wasn't all of a sudden. He told you it was coming perhaps five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour or three weeks ago that that big spook was building inside of him. You may not always know what the catalyst is that sends the horse over the edge in his spooky moment or his overreactive moment. And the thing that often saddens me is when I hear people judge the horse's highly reactive moment, like, oh, you know what that is. You've been here before. Why can't you just do it? You should accept this by now. Oh, he's just being dumb. Oh, he's just trying to psych you out. They come up with all of this human emotional banter and filter and judgment and critique. And so if the human is thinking that, what do you think their communication to the horse is? The horse is completely mentally and emotionally melting down. His proverbial cup is overflowing. Physically, he's going in five different directions. He's highly reactive. He's highly defensive. And if the human is starting with a mindset of being critical, of being, we'll say, degrading, because many people are, whether they realize it or not, towards the horse, then how do you think the quality of that human's communication with whatever it may be, whether they're on the ground or in the saddle is? Do you think it offers support and specific communication to help the horse learn to think through, emotionally diffuse, and physically become soft? Probably not. And then people get surprised that the horse is spook that, you know, was sort of rideable or sort of reasonable six months ago, a year from now, has become so reactive and so dramatic that maybe it's getting to the point where it's scaring the rider. And then the rider goes, well, I just don't know what happened. And this is where I always have to slow people down and say, it is your job to help your horse. You are putting your horse in completely foreign, unnatural situations. And if you are not taking the responsibility and being accountable to slow down, 
doesn't matter what your task is, doesn't matter what your agenda is, doesn't matter if you agree whether your horse should be scared of something or not. If he is conveying fear, you must help him. If you don't help him, you are forcing him to choose to take over to protect himself. And most of the time, the ways that the horse has to protect himself is usually not what the human has in mind, whether it's big dramatic movement, whether it's a high rate of speed of moving and leaving. So I wish more people took the time to slow down and start to recognize and learn how to read the horse's behavior when he's telling you in a mild, reasonable state that he has concern instead of whether it's ill intention or not, forcing the horse to basically contain his fear, contain his defensiveness, and force him with usually a lot of pressure into situations that are potentially concerning for him and then acting surprised, critical, reactive towards the horse when he acts big, when he gives you that spook, when he jumps sideways 20 feet. The horse didn't start out that way. He has learned if you don't show up when he asks for help. He has learned if you add pressure when he's unsure and needs time to learn to think through a situation and you're just looking for the physical movement. So much of the dramatic reactive behavior is a consequence and a result of all of the unintentional moments that the human has been teaching the horse that the horse is on his own, that he has to learn to deal with the situation. And when the human interjects, it's only going to add more fear, more stress, more defensiveness. And so what do we resort to? The bigger, the more dramatic the, the horse becomes in the moments of doing things, we add equipment as if that's going to fix something. You can't stop your horse at a bigger bit. Well, what happens six months from now if you didn't actually fix the root cause and you're just dealing with a horse who's always taking off with you, adding a stronger bit or anything with leverage or anything that gives you the illusion of more control is not going to fix the problem. And maybe that behavior of bolting, maybe it will decrease because you finally find a severe enough piece of equipment to put on your horse's face. But guess what? That unwanted defensive behavior in him is going to morph into another unwanted defensive behavior because you didn't actually address the root cause. So the next time you start to see your horse getting emotional, getting defensive, becoming unsure, have a little empathy. Not to be in a state of leaving it up to the horse of however he chooses to do something, but to say, wow, the behavior he's showing me, the mental distraction he's showing me, the physical tension he's showing me, I need to believe it, I need to interject, and I need to help him learn to work through these scenarios, and therefore I'm diffusing the potential spook. So thank you for joining me, and I will see you next Friday for an all-new Dear Sam.